gave everyone an extra minute, but we've got a lot of folks in here, which is amazing to see. I hope everyone got a snack or something so they're not crashing this afternoon. Um, we're gonna talk about migrations today. A migration is a terrible thing to waste. Roadmap for your next content, next big content migration. You'll notice that there are two folks on the slide and there's only one up here. Uh, I'm Mark Dorison. Chris Free wrote this talk with me and we uh, gave it elsewhere, but he was not able to make it this week. So I'm giving it solo. Uh, you'll also note that um, our roles at Chromatic, Chris and I are also no longer at Chromatic. We're on new adventures, but this is still a Chromatic talk. We produce this at Chromatic. We love the Chromatic folks. They bought my dinner last night, so thank you for that. Uh, and there's some of them here. Um, but I am consulting now as um, a fractional CTO. Thank you, Chromatic. But Chromatic is a digital agency with over 16 years of experience building websites and applications, usually powered by a CMS, frequently Drupal. And in particular, these are some of the wonderful folks that have worked, that I worked with and worked with Chromatic over the years. Um, we've migrated millions of pieces of content for some of these brands, um, including Outside Magazine, Better Homes and Gardens, Martha Stewart, Harvard, and most recently, uh, the John F. Kennedy Library, which was an incredible um, project integrating their digital asset management system. So I think it's important to start and define what kind of migration we're talking about. Um, what we're not talking about today are infrastructure migrations. So um, moving your site, your applications from one hosting provider to another, that would be a migration, but not what we're gonna talk about today. Um, we're gonna talk about moving data from one system to another. So generally, especially for the people in this room and in my experience, that's gonna be moving data from uh, one system to another, one of those is frequently gonna be a web CMS, but not always. Maybe both of them are web CMS. And we're gonna talk about the different steps um, that I believe we should be addressing during that. We're gonna talk about analyzing, mapping, improving content, and then finally moving, which is where maybe where most people start thinking about it, like, oh, we're just gonna move this content, but we're gonna cover all those. So if you're in the content business, you're gonna have migrations every now and again, uh, and they are tricky. They are usually are a headache for just about everyone involved, and they often take much longer than you expect they're going to. But they don't have to be uh, so frustrating. And not only that, I believe they're a great opportunity to improve your content and your application. It's a moment where you are forced to really dig in and deal dig your hands in, get your hands dirty with all of the content that you've uh, accumulated over the years. So with a bit of extra effort, um, you're gonna come out the other, other side with better content, better uh, your application in a better state, um, and at least you'll have fewer headaches along the way. Gotta keep up with the transitions. So we wanna be better off on the other side of the migration. We're gonna assess our content, restructure it, improve it. Um, when you are packing up your home or your apartment to move, you wanna go through your stuff before you pack it up. You don't wanna load everything up, move it, then start unpacking and be like, why did I bring this box of stuff that I'm now going to toss? I wish I had spent the time beforehand to go through, edit my stuff, edit my clothes, edit my whatever it is. Let's toss that before we move it. And the same is true um, for a content migration. You're also gonna possibly restructure the content to fit your current and future business needs. I'm sure a lot of your content and a lot of your content types, if you were building them today, might look different than when you had built them one, five, 10 years ago when they were first created. You now know how your content has performed. Um, you now know the pain points that your editors have dealt with, both uh, your that your developers have dealt with. So um, that's this is an opportunistic moment, and we want to improve performance as well. Frequently, um, 
you know, when dealing with a migration and if we're just focused on getting the content from A to B, performance could easily fall by the wayside. It needs to be prioritized um, both in uh, SEO performance, page performance, um, all across the board. So Abraham Lincoln once said, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening the ax. Abraham Lincoln did not actually say that, but a guy with an ax said that, and I'm saying that today. <laughs> and it's true, especially in this case, the majority of the work here is actually going to be done before you do the, the migration itself. And first, where we start, we need to understand why we're migrating. There's a number of very different reasons that could be the cause of migration. Could be technical, maybe your platform is reaching end of life. Maybe some of you in this room are dealing with that with Drupal 7. Hey, we need to move to modern Drupal and part of that is going to be taking our content, migrating that to a new site that's being built. Could be functional, maybe a different platform has been selected for, that offers new functionality. If we're in this room here at DrupalCon, maybe Drupal is that uh, that platform, so maybe you're moving off a legacy CMS and moving into Drupal, um, and so that could be the reason for your migration. Or there could be an integration. So, you know, there could be a um, no platform change involved, but maybe you're integrating your Drupal system, in this case, to another system. So I mentioned previously the project that we did for the John F. Kennedy Library. That was an example of that. They had a digital asset management system with millions of um, pieces of content, really fascinating stuff from the 60s, and we, they wanted to integrate that with their Drupal web CMS and make them more tightly uh, integrated. So we used migrations, to a continuous migration, to keep that content flowing on make it available to their web editors on their web CMS. There could be a rebrand. So a rebrand is often a trigger event. Um, a lot of times rebrands get packaged with a, with a replatform and a migration. Could be the cause or it could be the effect. So a lot of times it's probably familiar to many of you. Maybe there's a rebrand on the horizon and you're thinking, okay, well we also need to, let's say, move off of Drupal 7. Well, maybe we should do them both together. Like, let's not rebrand in Drupal 7 and then start a migration, um, or vice versa. So, it's not uncommon for a rebrand. Again, maybe a rebrand is urgently needed. A client or uh, your organization is like, okay, we rebranded, um, we need this live ASAP on our web property. Again, that might trigger um, a migration, trigger a replatforming. So, the, all the, the answers to all the above are gonna affect what type of migration you should choose and how you will prioritize the work. So we need to audit our content. How many content types do we have is, is typically the very first question um, that you're gonna ask because that's going to tell you um, in the broadest strokes the scale and scope of your work. Also how many content items this actually matters less than you might think. Um, if you're writing a migration, a programmatic migration to, um, you know, it's gonna work whether you have 10 pieces of content in a content type or a million pieces of content in a content type. Now, with that million, there's gonna be more edge cases um, and that will take more time. But as once you've determined these are the number of content types that merit a programmatic migration, you know, that's, that's a very important uh, data point. If you only have 10 pieces of content in a content type, that might be a content type where you say, we're just gonna move that manually. That we can take care of, we don't need to write a programmatic uh, migration. You're also wanna, gonna wanna assess how your content types are structured. Are they, have they been built very atomically with a lot of fields? Um, really structured so that editors have a very clear indication of where each piece of the con part of the content item goes. Or there are a lot of blobs, or, or just a few blobs typically, where you open up that content and a lot of unstructured HTML. Our 
Are there a lot of inline styles or other markup that you're going to want to potentially remove or refactor as part of the migration? If you have a lot of, these, a lot of big blobs in your content types, that's gonna be a really important um, point to note when you're planning the migration. And a, a, I don't wanna say a red flag, but a yellow flag of saying, like these are p areas where we're going to need to investigate more deeply, find out are there inline styles there, especially if you've now, if we packaged a rebrand as part of this or one is on the horizon, how do we get that content to a point where the inline styles are not gonna cause us a problem later? Can I answer that at the end? Yeah. All right. Um, and what is your best content? So, and what is your worst performing content? So again, you might have content that, um, you know, no content type is created with the intention that it's not gonna perform. But if you've created something years ago and it didn't perform up to your expectations, maybe this is that moment to say, it's time to say goodbye to this content type. Um, it's just as important to identify those things and figure out what we're gonna say no to moving as it is to figure out how to move the stuff that we are going to move. So saying no to some of our areas of content is going to not only make the, you know, you know limit the scope of the migration and make that uh, process a little bit smoother, but also free up developer time in the future. It's an opportunity cost to say like, we're not gonna maintain or focus on that anymore. It's gonna give us more time and attention to focus on other pieces of the platform. Um, so figuring out what that is, and then for the best content, like are there improvements that could be made to that so that it, w we can enhance that, make better use of that, improve it for, for our editors maybe. You know, the flip side of what I just described is maybe you launched a content type without much thought and it turned out to be one of your best performing uh, content types, best performing areas of your site. Now is a moment to step back and rethink, okay, if we were building this today, is it exactly how we would do it? This is the moment. A lot of times it's so rare for us to, as um, you know, if you're on the side of building the site, to get time to go back and revisit some of those things. It's often like, it's working, just let it be. This is that moment. We're being forced to revisit it anyway by creating these migrations. Let's take advantage of that. So we're gonna improve our content. So once you've audited it, you can go deeper in thinking about how it's organized, how it can be improved. How well is it structured? Can we improve that? What is working great and what isn't? Is there duplicate content that could be consolidated? So this is both content items and content types. So take that time to figure out, like, you know, take that and figure out, understand what you have. If you, you know, especially, um, Maybe you've just joined an organization relatively recently and the content goes back much farther than your tenure. There's probably areas of the site, content types, um, you know, that you're not as familiar with. This is the moment to really wrap your head around all of that. We're gonna answer what can be left behind. Um, has your brand evolved? Um, maybe those content items and that content just don't make sense anymore. Has your target audience changed? Again, maybe you launched it thinking of a certain audience, but that is completely changed by now and it, the content makes less sense. This is the moment. Let's get rid of it. Let, now, I should note, um, I was at GovCon a few months ago and it can be a very different discussion when we're talking about this in a government context. So there might be, you, you know, especially, uh, and, and maybe other areas as well, there might be situations like that where you can't get rid of old content. You need it for historical or archive reasons. But this also might be a moment to you know, think about that and say like, well, are we, do, should we handle it in the same way, content that we are preserving only for archival purposes? Uh, does it need to live in the web CMS particularly and be public on the web? Or does it just need to be um, archived internally? Maybe it does. Um, but these are all the questions that you should be asking to make sure that you can make confident, um, have confident answers from them. I don't even wanna say uh, correct answers because that will only be determined in retrospect. Um, so if you can you know, discard content that's no longer serving you, don't bother migrating it. So 
what can be organized or bundled differently. Maybe there are um, content items, content types that have grown and shifted over time. Um, maybe they can be repackaged in new and interesting ways. This is the moment to take a look at those. There's a counterpoint to some of this. You want to control the scope and not you know, turn this in, in, into an entirely separate project. Um, but it's a fine balance. And so I believe you should at least be having these discussions, even if it only creates a future uh, project plan for other projects that you'll do after the migration. That's a totally normal and appropriate uh, part of this process. As we've dug our hands in, we uncovered what we want to do for the future. Now we have that plan. So you need to get a lot of internal stakeholders involved. Sometimes there'll be people at the organization that are um, not as technical, but are content experts. They are the MVPs of this process, like involve them, um, really lean on them to understand the history of the content, how it's being, how it was originally uh, envisioned. Uh, that'll tell you a lot um, and how it's being used now. Some other things to consider um, during this process, can you improve tagging? Uh, can you in extract embedded features like photo galleries into discrete content types with their own metadata? Sometimes that makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. Um, or can you break down more complicated content types into more atomically structured items? So some of this work is going to inspire changes that, and features that otherwise wouldn't be possible. So um, take the time to sketch these out, plan them. Your developers will thank you for that. And um, you're not going to be able to make all these changes at this point. But this is tough work, and it, there's not a paint-by-numbers approach. So if you can get like 70% of the way there, that's a huge, huge win. Make the most of automation. Computers are great at automation. I, and um, in all my work, have been a big fan of automating everything that we can. There's so many smart brains on all of our teams and in this room, but there's a lot of work that doesn't need to, well, I would say that um, most all of us are typically constrained in the amount of time we have. We rarely have enough time or too much time. So what can we automate so that we pass that, pass that work off, automate it, give ourselves and our teams more time to work on the truly hard stuff? Um, AI can be great here. Um, this is an area where um, improving content uh, taxonomy and metadata, I wouldn't turn an AI tool loose without oversight on this. But if you think about the amount of time on a large set of content it would take editors to review every piece of content and manually tag it, let's say it doesn't have um, taxonomy tagging, it would be a great opportunity to use AI to, to draft tags and then use editors to review and approve those tags. This can benefit SEO, ma marketing, social media strategies. Clean up messy and unwanted HTML. We mentioned that when talking about big blobs. How do we get that out, um, out of that? I have a ton of empathy for editors who, to get their job done, are forced to you know, put in raw HTML into, uh, into Drupal nodes, into content, to make it do what they need to do. Um, there's always a good reason for that. It's not necessarily, I, would, I wouldn't always agree with that, but as a, you know, an engineer, we have different goals and different things that we're trying to get done in a day than an editor does. That said, now is the moment to be like, okay, how do we clean this up? How do we try to figure out what problem were our editors trying to solve? They were trying to solve a problem by, taking, by putting that HTML in there. Is there a different way that we can, a uh, different structure that we can build, different functionality to give them the tools so they don't have to do that in the future? This, in my experience, is a, is a very important part of this process, very valuable part of this process. Like, how do we make those editorial tools better on the other side? 
I've rarely met an editor who is, you know, who loves their CMS. They, they'll, they might like it better than the last one that they used, but they all have a ton of complaints. So this is a great opportunity to check in with them, get their input, and really improve what's their, going, their tool that they're gonna have on the other side of this process. It's a great moment to identify and correct broken hyperlinks. This is important for a number of reasons, especially SEO. Um, but we can do that. We can use some, uh, we can use tools uh, to go through those. And I have some uh, that I'll share in a moment to help you identify those and rectify them. We want to ensure, uh, optimize and create media assets along the way. Drupal does a fantastic job of this out of the box, but again, if editors have utilized other non-standard ways of including media, like this is the moment to reassess that, figure out what's not working for them, and make sure that we're following um, you know, best practices as far as the CMS is concerned so that media assets are optimized as we expect. So then we're gonna map it out. Um, for each of the content types, uh, map out both the source and the destination. If you've done a lot of what I've discussed so far, you're gonna have some differences. It's not gonna be one-to-one. -one. You might be going from just a few fields on some content types to a long list. So figure out like how that is going to map and get it all written down in black and white somewhere that everyone on the team can see it, review it, reference it. Um, and then start to figure out where you want to do those modifications. So you could do them in the source uh, system before you migrate. You could do them in flight during the migration programmatically, or you could do them in the destination once you've migrated. There is not a single answer. It's going to depend, and it's, it's not, that's not something you would decide for the entire set of changes. That might be some, that is gonna be something that you determine on a case-by-case -case basis where it makes the most sense. Um, I suppose that in, in many cases, doing it in flight where you're already mapping a programmatic migration, you're already, you've already got your content passing through um, your code, so that's a great place to do a lot of modification, but it doesn't always make sense. And be sure to identify what tools are available. Since we are talking specifically about Drupal here, the Drupal Migrate module is incredible, and it's in core now. Um, has been since Drupal 8. Um, and so you're gonna lean on that very heavily if you're migrating into Drupal. Um, if, you're, if you have WordPress in the picture, you know, they're, they're, they have tools as well that are great. But any system, including if you're migrating from a legacy CMS or you're integrating with a digital asset management system, they're all going to have, some, you know, well, most of them are going to have migration-specific tools that you can utilize. And then the number one probably uh, tool that you'll use is a bunch of spreadsheets, especially when you're mapping. You're going to have a ton of spreadsheets, one, one sheet for each content type probably at least. Um, so you'll do a lot of that. Everyone worries about SEO during a big, big migration, and you should. Um, we've done this enough times to know that you have to consider and plan, have an SEO plan for each of the projects. There's always going to be SEO turbulence um, with any large content migration. Um, but I have some tips, and it begins during the planning. So URLs and 301s might be the, the most important thing. Um, you need to know what your URL strategy is for your new system. Is it identical to your current system? That, that, that would be great, but you need to know that for sure. Um, if it's not, that's okay too. You just need to know that and plan for it um, because you'll wanna create 301 redirects during your migration to make sure that your old URLs get redirected to the new paths. Another uh, important piece that is often missed during migration is that you want to avoid URL hopping in your 301 redirects. This 
is frequently a problem if you have done previous migrations. So maybe you've moved from you know, one system 12 years ago into another system eight years ago, and now you're migrating again, you are probably gonna have redirects that were created during each of those migrations. So those, mi those redirects, in a perfect world, they still work. They're gonna go from A to B, B to C, and C to D. But that's not great from an SEO perspective. You want all of those redirects to be updated so that they all go from A to D, and B to D, and C to D. Um, so one hop for each of those 301 redirects. That's the best option. And that's a, great, that's a great example of something that you can do um, during the migration, like while the data is in flight, you can make those changes. So this is critical to ensure that you're maintaining uh, your SEO rank and optimizing that. SEO best practices are always evolving, but Google has an entire website dedicated just to that, uh, the Google Search Essentials. So make sure that you are reviewing this as part of your content migration now. And I should note, when we're talking about SEO here, and I think this is um, pretty um, typical for those of us in this room, but we're not talking about SEO from a content marketing perspective. We're talking about uh, SEO from a, con a technical content perspective. So. Um, when I'm working on a migration, like a big migration like this, I'm assuming that the, you've got great content. You've got um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of records, pieces of content. Um, it's not typically in scope to go, and uh, this is not the moment to be like, well, are, are our uh, titles optimized for, uh, for SEO as far as uh, what people are going to click on? What we're focused on is is the content structured correctly so it, the search engine crawler can properly parse everything, find it, you know, proper, properly rank it? Um, that's the technical side of SEO that we're really concerned with here, that is included on the 301s, included here, and how we're structuring the content. Um, this is something that you, all of these pieces um, if you have folks on your team that are focused on SEO, this is so important for them to be involved in the migration process and the migration planning. Performance is SEO. How fast your page loads is incredibly important for your ranking in SEO. If you're not familiar yet, you should get familiar with Google Core Web Vitals. Um, these are the metrics that Google uses to rank your site on a performance basis. Some of them, the important ones currently are largest contentful paint, cumulative layout shift, time to first bite. Um, you wanna make sure that your site performs well in these metrics. And these might change over time, but that's, um, you, know, you can remain updated directly from Google on what the metrics of the day or the year are. Um, it's important to set a performance budget. A lot of times this is not considered during, during a content migration, a platform migration, and performance is frequently something that is panicked about at the end once you've launched uh, the new site. It's a bad idea. You should set a budget, and maybe your budget is more aggressive. Maybe it is, we want to improve um, our performance as part of this migration. We want to improve by 20%, and that's your budget. But at the very least, I would advocate for, if, even if your uh, performance budget is more conservative, your, your budget should be, we don't want to regress. We don't want the performance to be worse on the new site um, than on our old site. So this is something that you want to do throughout the migration process. When you're building the new platform, when you're running and testing your migrations, you should be c continuously or regularly running performance tests and identifying if your budget is not being met. And if it is uh, not being met, you should treat that those things as bugs and prioritize them appropriately throughout the process. Um, other important pieces on uh, performance, 
native, native lazy loading. It's shipping in all major CMSs. It's been shipping in Drupal for a couple years now, at least, in core. Um, so make sure that um, you want to just confirm that all of your images um, and media are being rendered appropriately there. Again, this might be an issue with some of your legacy and older content um, that might be being rendered in a custom way. Um, coordinating, you want to coordinate with your IT or infrastructure team. Um, frequently in migrations, while we're not talking about infrastructure migrations directly here, th that's another thing that frequently gets bundled with a big migration or replatforming. Hey, we're moving from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10. We're also going to change our hosting environment. Like, that's a very common piece of it. So coordinate with them to make sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed as far as how your infrastructure is configured, how much traffic it's going to support, what the expectations are. You want to get those folks involved to make sure that they're invested in the performance budget and that, um, again, on the conservative side, you're at least not regressing, but hopefully you're even improving the performance of the site. Some SEO tools. This is a short list of a what could be very long, but I just wanted to share a couple. Uh, Screaming Frog, use this to audit an entire site, flag broken links and multiple redirect hops. Um, Moz, it's a similar tool. The uh, Screaming Frog is a desktop tool. Moz is a is a web tool. Uh, this includes also like keyword and competitor analysis, which is which is interesting and useful sometimes. Ahrefs, um, this is a different pricing model that is sometimes better, um, but these are all similar. And then, separate from those, what, regardless of any of those, Google PageSpeed Insights. This is where you want to go to monitor those core web vitals. This is this is the tool for that. So the other important piece to consider is what kind of migration are you go going to run? Now, we're, this is heavily influenced by the content and the uh, needs of the organization, but this is a very technical question. Um, and it's gonna influence stakeholder expectations, project planning, team structure. Um, oh, let me go back one second. Uh, so what's the difference? A cutover migration, um, this is probably, the, this is the most common. This is like, hey, we're going to build the new system, we're going to write all the migrations, and then we're going to run the migrations and flip a script. Now, it might be a little bit more complicated than that. You might need to coordinate with editors and say, okay, stop editing at this, you know, on this day, at this time, then we're going to run the migrations. When Drupal.org migrated from Drupal 6 to Drupal 7, that was, it was essentially a cutover migration. And Drupal.org was taken offline for about a day so that they could run this migration. Now, a continuous uh, migration is going to be where parts of the site are migrated one at a time. So you might split this up by content type. For example, let's say you have uh, a MarthaStewart.com you might move recipes first. Okay, we're gonna migrate all recipes and we are going to start serving recipes um, on the web from the new system while all other content types are still being served from the old system. Now, this is technically more complicated. You also have, you, you need to write a migration that's gonna continuously run so that when new recipes are put in in the old system, they're going to migrate to the new system so they can be served. You also need uh, configuration and infrastructure to figure out where to send the requests. How to, you know, some, a URL that goes to a recipe needs to go to one piece of infrastructure. Everything else needs to go to another piece of infrastructure. So those are some of the complications of this, but what the benefits are that you get to work more iter iteratively. You can launch your new system and one and then two and then three of your migrations one at a time, you can learn from them. You can then go back and take all that you've learned on recipes and roll it into articles and photo galleries and spread that out. 
for big migrations, complicated migrations, this is very valuable because also it's a lot of risk to, um, you know, to migrate a million pieces of content um, and do it all with the flip of the switch. Um, this is how the new uh, Drupal.org migration is going to, is occurring right now. There are already pieces of Drupal.org that are running on Drupal 10 um, and it's being served from two infrastructures and soon more will be moved over to Drupal 10 and then over time everything will be on Drupal 10 and then 11. So cut over migration, way simpler. Prepare and write all your migrations, test them, and then the actual switch happens one time. It requires you to do everything at once. It's way simpler from a technical perspective, but less agile for migrations with many content types. This might matter less if your site only has one or two content types. It might you know, make zero sense to do anything but this. But, um, but it will require some, may require some amount of downtime in my experience. Um, and it, this is the most common type of migration. That continuous migration, it's more complex. You need to maintain both new and old infrastructure, um, but it can help mitigate some risks. And I've frequently used this sites with a massive amount of content. Uh, if a re-platforming and a migration is gonna take two years, I want to be able to show results sooner than that and not be waiting uh, to show stakeholders results for that entire time period. That's a really painful discussion to have with folks. We want to be able to, you know, the first one will take the most time. The first one is, would be the most complicated, first content type you might launch. The second one will be complicated too. Um, figuring out what you've done that only applies to one, but then every one after that will be exponentially simpler. And you're not done. Um, if you've done a great job on all of these steps, this last follow-up bit, the post-migration bit, will be easier than it would be otherwise. Um, migrations with not as much planning, those are the ones where you're gonna have a lot of follow-up and a lot of, you're probably gonna be surprised by how much follow-up. Mitigating SEO issues, mitigating performance issues, figuring out um, suddenly now everyone's gonna start looking at the site with fresh eyes and asking questions that haven't been asked in years about why did we do this like this? Why And why did we move it like this, keep it this way? Again, this is the, um, this is the experience of opening all your boxes in your new home and, and asking yourself, why did I move this? Why did I think this was important? We're gonna do a great job though, so we're gonna have fewer of those, but there's still going to be um, follow-up that needs to be done. Build this into your plan um, so, that you, so that you're not surprised. You're gonna monitor SEO impacts before, during, and after. We, we wanna be able to tell you know, where we started and where we are now. Um, Google Console is valuable here as well as some of the previously mentioned tools. So take those baselines before and then you can compare them to the um, reports after. Um, and hopefully you're gonna have very little turbulence if, if, uh, if you've checked all these boxes. Performance, um, there's a number of tools that we like. Up, down uh, to monitor whether your sites are up. New Relic for application performance and Backtraces, this is fantastic when you're trying to debug uh, tricky issues. Um, Caliber, this is a really great tool uh, for monitoring, monitoring Google Core Web Vitals over time. And you can configure thresholds. This is super valuable when you're uh, setting a performance budget. You can configure this to say like, test on this interval um, and report if we drop below a certain amount. Um, very, very useful and valuable. Sentry is great for uh, error monitoring and alerting. Um, I use this uh, on all of our sites so that we're getting exception reports uh, delivered to us without going directly to the site. So again, you can configure thresholds, when you're alerted, how you're alerted, where you're alerted but 
if I'm not on the site daily, I don't want to have to discover an exception myself or discover it because a user was kind enough to email it to me. If they've hit an exception, I want to be able to see it in our reporting. So, um, you know, that's a really valuable tool. There's other tools that do similar things as that. These are just the ones that I like and have had experience with. So you're going to take all this, take all your SEO uh, reports, all of your uh, exception reporting, all of your performance reporting. You're going to triage those things and resolve and respond iteratively. Start at the top, the top being what is the most impactful, what exceptions are occurring the most frequently, what performance metrics are the most far out of your performance budget, and then work your way down the list. This is at, this is at a minimum a sprint after your um, after you've launched, but you know, and then it might taper off, but it but that would be a minimum. You know, this needs to be built into the plan. And then repeat as needed. If you're doing a uh, continuous migration, then you're going to loop back to work on the next content type or set of content types. Um, but at the very least, even in a cutover migration, you're going to work your way down the list. So we've covered tips and tools for planning your next migration. We've talked about ways you can improve your content, how you can minimize SEO risk and turbulence, deciding on cutover versus continuous, the type of migration, and then what, how to think about post-migration. That's all I have for you today, but I know I have at least one question, but I'd love to hear even more, and if I don't remember to repeat the question for the recording, please remind me. First uh, up. Question was pertaining to blogs and uh, what, what part of the migration to tackle them that I think you addressed. Can I, so let me repeat it for the recording. So th there was a, it was a question about blobs and um, structured content, but apparently I already answered the question. Okay. Yes, over here. So I have two. Uh, first, how do you do the content type? How do you uh, in what typical list do you have the content types for those kind of blogs? Do you just mention what they are? Sure. Uh, the question was, how do I think about content types? What would be a typical list for migration? Um, you're not going to like this answer, but it completely depends on the business and the needs of the business, um, what you're trying to achieve. Um, I mean, I can tell you that most of the, um, some pretty common ones regardless is article of some type. Uh, seen plenty with uh, photo galleries. Um, you know, recipes might be one that would be like a counterexample. Like, okay, that really is, you know, you know if you need a recipe content type, right? That's an example um, that's a great counterexample because it's the, the type of uh, data is so specific and structured as opposed to other things where you're maybe having a discussion like, well, is this an article or should this be its own content type? Like, is this truly different? A recipe is a counterexample to that because you always know if you have a recipe and you've got things like um, serving uh, amounts and quantities and um, like uh, cook's notes and uh, sequential steps and things like that that are very specific only to something like a recipe. But beyond that, um, you know, it's going to be very different if it's a news site or a breaking news site as opposed to university site, yeah, I mean, you're going to have, you might have content types for syllabus, for classes, for, uh, you know, white papers, for um, um, faculty, for, um, you know, news items, blog posts, um, yeah. Yeah. The question, the question is, um, 
for an example, like a university where a migration is, has occurred or is occurring? Is it in process? Um, the rebranding has taken place. Rebrand has taken place. The migration is very, very slow. Okay. okay, the rebrand has taken place, the migration is slow, and you've got stakeholders that are unable to find content. Um, What leads to that? Well, not enough planning. Uh, I mean, I think that if they're having trouble finding content as far as navigating the site and from a rebrand perspective, that's really like an information architecture question. Um, if they're having problem finding content, like as far as if there's, they have URLs that are no longer working, that's a redirect question. Like why is this old URL no longer functioning? It should be sending, um, you know, redirecting to the new location of the content. Um, you know, I've been involved in projects where stakeholders early in the project really didn't understand the value of that. They're like, it, I don't care what the, you know, if there's a redirect, people will find it. Then other stakeholders come in later once it's launched and, you know, despite my best recommendations and, you know, for all the reasons discussed in the talk, SEO, user experience, all that, um, you know, that's really, you know, that would be a failing of myself if I couldn't convince them of that because inevitably they're going to show up and say, where is this content? It's not working. URL's not working. Path's not working. But if it's, if it's just navigating the site, that's kind of more of a rebrand information architecture um, naviga navigability question. You're welcome. Yes. One, one of them, yeah. Yeah, you were doing the new content in one of the sites. Did you do all the migrations first and then do migrations on each of those ones, or did you address all of them in every migration? Great question. The question is, in a continuous migration, do you need to specifically account for um, new content going in, or is a full migration occur every time of, let's say there's 100,000 pieces of content, every time the migration runs, does all 100,000 pieces of content need to move, or just the 10 that are not there? That's gonna depend on how you've implemented the migration, but the great news is if you're using Drupal Migrate, it will more or less just work as far as catch up migrations. I forget the, is that the correct technical term? There is a, you know, the, it will track uh, the delta um, for what's been upgrade, what's been migrated, and it will check for what's new and only pull what has been modified. It's uh, an amazing tool. We only have a few minutes left, so any other questions? Yeah. Um, the question is for content that is more blob structured. Um, blob's just kind of a <laughs> contradiction. That is structured more with blobs than, than with uh, individual fields. Is there an efficient way or a tool to determine if uh, the content items have inline HTML in them? Does that yeah. sum it up? Um, I mean, you could query the database directly uh, for those fields. You could also use the migrate tools themselves to, uh, to check that. So you could run test migrations, and as part of the test migration, uh, part of the migration, you could add logging to your migrations that you know, log data about each piece of content that you discover that has markup in it or something or anything that you're looking for really so you can really use those tools to audit your content in a programmatic way okay that's what I, I was thinking about database farm it's just seems like it's anything like cheap but the logging for migration sounds pretty cool so i'm gonna have to check it out thank you you're welcome we might have time for one more
Are you talking about like Google search or the site search? Okay, so the question is, if you've done a migration and you have content that you expect to be showing up in site search um, and it's not, um, what, what do you recommend? That's probably an entire talk uh, unto itself and the, because the, you know, the first question is, well, are we using the same search engine that we were using before? Is it completely different? How is it configured? Uh, I mean, and that would be a great thing to get on the checklist as you're doing the migration. Like, let's compare how search results are showing up in the old system versus the new system. What do we expect? Um, and then, you know, tr again, if there's uh, if there are issues with that regressions and that, then you you know treat that as a bug, the debug. But it's really that's a different problem than in some ways than what I spoke about today, just because um, with Google and other search engines, it's more of a black box. You're like, okay, we can do everything we can, but then it's up to them to crawl it. That is actually well within our control, the internal site search. So it's like, okay, well now we gotta crack the hood open and figure out what's going on with our search engine for the site. I wish I could be more specific, but that's a, that's a complicated uh, in-depth one. All right, thank you everyone so much.